And we're back. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about my shoulder for a minute because we talked a little bit. Of, yeah, we talked a little bit about it with Jordan Shallow. And uh, it hurts. And uh, so I had an appointment today. And apparently I'm having at least like a scope done in May. And the final call is maybe bulging disc in the neck ish causing this or not? Nah? No, apparently that I mean I don't have any numbness, yeah. and so that's that's like symptom one of yeah. bulging disc. I do have disc degeneration stuff, but it's not bulging out into the into the nerve in that way. And what I've gathered from who knows where knowledge of my talking to PTs and whatever over time is bulging disc and degenerative whatever disc disease uh, is going to happen to majority of humans yes. uh, and especially going to happen to majority of humans that lift. Yes. And then the consequences or the pain from there may be semi-random. Some people have degenerative bulging, five bulging discs and don't feel a thing. Some people have a sl- one slight bulging disc and they can't feel their left leg. Yeah. And it's something that Jordan talked about and I think it's it's uh, definitely, uh, definitely true. The years ago now, it's back in 04 before I Six like six months before I started powerlifting, I had a bunch of imaging done, and uh, I had some shitty discs then, right. and it's probably um, uh, not any worse now. Yeah. Other than you know, not really. Yeah. Because I'm because I don't have numbness. Yeah, I had a uh, first X-ray done from a chiro when I was in eighth grade because my hip felt like it went out of place and mm. I couldn't like run for a week and who knows what it actually is but she said then uh, in 8th grade like yeah your low back's going to have be some issues or some degenerative and this moves a little wonky and yeah, like, yeah. Oh, alright that's great and then now everyone says it's because I don't know how to lift I'm like alright that's why yeah th- there couldn't be anything inherent about your body yeah. that you couldn't prevent from th- happening I, I, just based on how you lift I had back pain when I was 13 <laughs> oh yeah, so, yeah, and, then, yeah. and then I played 10 more years competitive basketball and then another 10 years of powerlifting like, what do you think is going to fucking happen? I remember being a kid. I remember I'm being maybe 14 or something like that, 14, 15, playing volleyball, going up for the ball. Like, so I'm in the air. My arms are totally extended above me and having my lower back completely yeah. lock up and, like, fell to the to earth like like Superman got hit with kryptonite. I mean, yeah, I yeah. just, like, bam. Back pain sucks. Oh, my God. And I couldn't breathe, like, at the time, you I got, was like, <laughs> um, some kind of shot today. Yeah, L- I did. Lina? Uh, lidocaine, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we're trying to figure out what's going on with the shoulder. And back in the beginning of January, I had a lido injection into the glenohumeral joint, joint the actual joint. And um, and this just tries to take away some inflammation from maybe? No, all, all it is is, is diagnostic. It's like, okay, is the problem here? So if we take away all the pain in this spot. Oh, so it's a, like a pain number. Yeah. So oh, if, right. if 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 it's if that takes care of most of the pain or some of the pain or all Something's the pain, there. then there's something going on in that spot. Gotcha. We don't know exactly what it is, but something. So I had that done, and it was better, but what it did was point up how much – how my how tight my neck still was and about half an hour or so after the shot i was able to really stretch up my neck out pretty good yeah and so there was sort of kind of a little bit of a durable result from that and then uh and then i went in today after waiting an hour and 15 minutes to actually see the doctor because of a scheduling issue on their side not mine happens uh i i enjoy a doctor that i can have actual conversation with and they're I, I get a lot of stuff. I don't. I'm. I'm a little bit downplaying what I know when we have our conversation sure. because I'm not so sure of it. I and don't you don't want to come in being a smart. And I don't want to be coming yeah. being a smart ass. Yeah, I don't want to be a, a Cliff, Cliff Clavin. So, but I can have a conversation and I can I can follow this stuff partly because I just know what what the Latin roots are sure. and I know what the systems are and I've been married to a nurse for yeah yeah a long plus time. strength and conditioning like just yeah. anatomy and exactly. whatever yeah That's exactly nice. exactly I will say that my wife does not have any sense of of the anatomy and physiology of strength at all yeah yeah and so the muscular system is barely messed with in that in yeah. That yeah. yeah, they don't. They don't deal with it. It's yeah. just like if it's not a, it's not a an, an organ. Right. I don't know about yeah, it. Yeah, or cold. Yeah, <laughs> if it's a rash, I have no clue. Yeah. So anyway, we're this doctor and I are able to actually sort of go back and forth about like, well, what about this? What about that? Like, well, what about like if we do some more imaging of my neck since we have a baseline from 04? And she's like, yeah, we don't have any numbness though. Like, I, I don't, I don't understand what the mechanism would be. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, okay, well, let's look at the MRI that you had done a few months ago. It's like, hmm. so it's this, but maybe it's this. And she's like, did they 
did when they did the injection, did they do one or two? I said, just one. So where do they go? A glenohumeral. Okay, well, let's try subacromial and see if that makes a difference. And so she's like, she runs out of the room. She comes back with lidocaine, and she's like, jump up I'll here be, and take your shirt off. And is that like, a big needle or not? Not really. Not very. I hate no. needles. It's mm, yeah, probably out. about three inches. Yeah, I'm out. I don't know how far she went. And she went, it's not like I looked. Yeah. You know, they 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 freeze spray the skin so you don't feel it go in anyway. You don't look. I'm a sissy. Yeah, yeah it's not. I'm it's, lucky I haven't had have shots in a while. <laughs> got all that shit done when I was young. <laughs> you, might, uh, you might need boosters now. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I'm going to try not to think about it. Yeah. This is a vaccinating podcast, just so yeah. everybody knows. Yeah. Yeah. We vaccinate. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I went off about that on a Just Kidding Films episode. <laughs> uh, it was an anti-vax story we covered. Yeah. I think the kid, what was it? His mom was anti-vax. He ended up getting vaccinated right. when he was yeah, 18 yeah. or something yeah, yeah. and some story. And I, I freaked out at people about the plague. And I make up, we make, people don't understand on the internet you're making jokes because we talked about like a bunch of diseases, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you got to get vaxxed to stop this, you know? Mm-hmm. And that we know vaccinations don't stop whatever the fuck we're throwing out. Mm-hmm. We're talking about whatever. Mm-hmm. And people are coming like, these idiots don't it's, even know what a virus is. It's comedy. Yeah, you fucking. It's comedy. Uh, so anyway, uh, she stuck it in there and she's like, okay, so like, give it a few minutes, move it around. She's like, you know, just like chicken wing in a little bit. And <laughs> she literally said that, yeah, that's uh, technical term. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, actually that's a lot better. So in that space, so narrowing it down, slowly. narrowing it down. So scope, uh, they'll go, go in. If there's a bunch of junk in this subchromial space, clean that stuff out. Yeah. If that. You know, that could be the only problem. Yeah, it could be. Who it could knows? be causing some friction and Who knows? inflammation things. Um, but, uh, and if if it's not, and the labrum, labrum looks bad, they'll try to repair that, which means like yeah. six to nine months of Doesn't sound fun. recovery. Not, you know what we need is we need Mark Cuban and his German studies. I read this so long ago, and I, I never saw the results, but he was funding a bunch of stuff in Germany for like stem cells, HGH, mm. and all these things because we won't freaking study it or get down on it Yeah, here. yeah. Uh, but obviously he has a lot of money in pro athletics, uh, and so he's trying to figure out ways to keep these people around longer. Um I, I do wish uh, studies would be. I don't know. I don't know the law on studies or uh, studying illegal things, and and I know there's different cases and routes you can go about those things. But often, when something's illegal, you can't really study it here by a bigger university because the substance or the whatever is the yeah there are morals ethic, yeah ethical eth- problems yeah. yeah and I get it I get it I get human it. subjects I fucking get it but I wish we could find some ways uh, to work around. Uh, Stem cells, HGH, things that, that, and I know they use some of that in clinical settings, but um, it would be much better if we were leading the way rather than letting the rest of the world do it. Yeah, I mean, they do a lot of PRP in, in yeah. Europe, and I'm I'm a fan. It doesn't work 100% of the time. It doesn't work 100% even when it works, Yeah, but it's valuable. There's a lot of things. It, like, literally, I feel like an American, again, I, I hate doctors, so I don't go all the time. I'm no expert, but like, I feel like, all right, they're going to give you Advil and tell you to stop doing what you're doing, or they're going to give you surgery. Uh, like my, that's all they do. Yeah, my current doctor hasn't ever laid a finger on me. My not the not the one that I met with today. I met with a with an Specialist. orthopedic surgeon today, who um, is just one of those one of those people you can have a conversation with. Uh, my regular doctor, like I had something going on with my foot when I went in a while back, and he did not get any closer than pretty much the door to yeah. my foot. So um, he didn't really observe anything at all. Based paid on by the uh, going, paid by the client. Yeah, Gotta pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. Like a goddamn car wash, they're just pushing yeah. them through. So uh, one a thing that the doctor said to me today, which I think is a good thing to keep in mind, is that uh, they tell you in medical school that if you hear ho- hoof beats, or hoof, you know, what the fuck is that called when? Clap, clap. You know hoof, what? It, whatever. A hoof on the ground. Yes, when yeah, you hear sure. when you hear hear horses. When you hear not horses. <laughs> when you hear. F- that destroys the entire joke. <laughs> Fuck me. Uh, when you hear, I want to say hoof beats. I don't know exactly. Hoof, uh, I don't know. Hoof, uh, hoofing? <laughs> Clumps. Clumps, sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, uh, uh, assume it's a horse. Don't assume it's a zebra. True. Okay. So. Uh, I don't get it, though. Just to restate a zebra, this. A zebra uh, could make that so, noise, eh? Yeah, a zebra could make that noise. But it's but less it's, likely to be. It's probably a horse. 
what if that joke's done in where somewhere zebras inhabited? It doesn't work then, eh? It doesn't work there. Just, no. That's just an American joke. No, it's just pretty much an American <laughs> joke. Or any place that doesn't have just zebras. America had zebras at one point, but we don't have them Native? anymore. Native? Yeah, uh, like a long time ago. Yeah, oh, yeah. We had our own version of zebras. Oh, makes sense. Yeah, they've been extinct for a long time. Fucking anyway, back to, to me. I'm a zebra, apparently, because very often the thing that is seems obvious oh yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's the, th- the thing that would be wrong with everybody else sure. is not the thing that's wrong with me but that's the, that's the kind of the definition or, or or what 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 shows a true expert from a non-expert is having a huge pool of tools and trying to diagnose yeah. right like it sounds like your orthopedic surgeon has a brain is, and is digging through all these possibilities right. trying to trying to eliminate things it's the same thing as a mechanic oh my exhaust is making this noise he's not just going to switch the exhaust he's going to try to find different things that may be causing it and slowly eliminate same thing when you oh I can't build up my bench press well let's figure out a couple things you've been doing let's yeah. see some things that we might be able to add we might be able to take away and we'll really build that thing up with a big tool rather than just kind of black and white horse hoof or zebra yeah it's, it's like figuring out how systems work and being able to troubleshoot that's yeah. my dad was a mechanic yeah, and, same and thing. it's the same it's it's yeah. remarkably the same yeah. thing people who work with computers Remarkably the same thing. Yeah. It's just understanding how systems work and being able yeah. to. It's um, just how complicated that system is. Just uh, com- how a 1970 that car is. is probably a little less complicated than a 2019 car, and a little less complicated than the human body. Uh, yeah, this is true. Like if I if I go up, I go out in the parking lot and I raise the hood on my Focus. Ace I'm not plastic. Gonna, yeah, yeah, it's just I have no idea what's going on in there. I I understand where the battery is now because I had to change it, but other than that, I really Even the don't battery know. on some of these fucking cars are hidden way the fuck. Oh yeah, went. mine's under a cover and yeah. it's up almost yeah. into the dash. Yeah, you and can't even like, change it. Holy crap! Can't even change it. <sighs> All right, so um, yeah, so just in, in terms of making things complicated and and talking about systems, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Ramsey's um. Uh, dissertation topic, which has to do with monitoring workload. Yeah, I think uh, you know he, he is an NBA strength coach and uh, likes to lift himself, kind of a bro. Does a little powerlifting, a little weightlifting, a little bodybuilding. But uh, I think his dissertation is monitoring the workload in NBA players to obviously help longevity and injuries and everything else. And, yeah, and then, and, then, and then you can scale that everywhere if you can do it for. You know, LeBron James, who's playing 82 games uh, a year, 30 minutes, and putting his body through hell because they still lift weights and they still do mm-hmm. all these things uh, in the off offseason uh, or even during the season. They're running. they got to stay in shape, and they have to perform not only optimally but at the highest level optimally. Um, if you can do it for him, you could probably scale that all the way down to a sixth grader that's playing sports. Um, yep. Do you need to monitor them as much? No, because their output probably isn't as hard, right? Mm-hmm. They can't rev it the same going to a car reference. You know, a little beater engine can't rev as hard as this high-performance 1,000-horsepower engine, so you have to monitor the 1,000-horsepower engine a little bit more. But you can go all the way in between to a power lifter. Um, and this is stuff, you know, I kind of do for power lifters, too, and, and coaching high school athletes or, or whatever it might be. And, and, in, and how I do it's fairly basic, and there's a couple things you start to look at. You know, if I have a uh, basketball player, you know, one of the best basketball players I ever coached, shot to little Chris, you know, he was playing – Year-round basketball, because that's how you get recruited to college. Yeah. Um, multiple games a week, minimum two games a week, probably minimum two to three practices a week. Plus, he's trying to lift in with me. Uh, we start to monitor how many hours uh, a week he's playing, and I, and I look at that because during a, a basketball season, he's playing more. Even though he's playing competitively mm-hmm. off-season, it's probably a little bit less or a little bit more casual. Mm-hmm. Um, I look at uh, how he's feeling, just conversations. Hey, how you feeling mentally? And I don't tell him like because he's an eighteen year old kid. You don't ask him how he's feeling. Just like, hey man, what's up? You just have to start have some conversations with him. You start to get his. You know, he comes in the gym fucking skipping and talk about mm-hmm. his date last night. Mm-hmm. I know he's probably revved up, ready to go. Mm-hmm. If he comes in droping, chucks his bag in the corner, he's probably not as motivated for the day, which could be signs. Again, we're just troubleshooting. It's not mm-hmm. for sure, but it could be signs of not necessarily quote unquote overtraining, but a higher stimulus or more fatigue. Um, he's got achy knees. You know, you got achy knees. You, you Okay, we're not going to squat today. We're just going to do some light body work, get some blood going, maybe a little conditioning, get him feeling better. Um, and again, it's just kind of finding what he's doing right now, how he's feeling, and hopefully catching it before it happens. Yeah. Right? Hopefully you keep him revved up. And it's the most basic thing for powerlifting as well. Yeah, and so you're, you're looking at um, certain criteria, 
um, how well someone is recovering is really high on that list, I guess, from yeah. from the from whatever their current workload is. And yeah, ask them how they're eating, how ask them how they're sleeping. Hey, man, did you could sleep last night. Yeah, yeah or, you know, and, and as they get older, it starts to get, uh, uh, for Ramsey's case in the NBA, it's complicated, man. They got long ass seasons, mm. millions of dollars on the line. Mm-hmm. They're still normal humans. You don't think mm-hmm. they're going out to the bars? Of course, they're going out to the bars. Yeah. Of course, plus the travel. They're traveling every single day, switching time zones, sleeping out of a backpack, going into hotels. You know, like some of these guys might not be sleeping. Yeah, they're not monks. And you're dealing with different types of people. You're you're dealing with a 19 year old that just got out of college and got paid $5 million, living the fucking dream. Who knows what that kid's doing? And you're dealing with a 35 year old who's very good at the sport and and maybe a little bit more accustomed now. Maybe he still likes to party, maybe he doesn't, right? So another big thing is, you know, personality type and and kind of knowing your your athletes. Mm -hmm. And and you also have the people who, who spend a lot of time uh, thinking about it and learning about it and have their own thoughts about how they they should be doing stuff. Right. It gets complicated at the pro level too because some have their own strength coaches, some yeah. have their own nutritionists, yeah. some have their own uh, other things. And so, you know, obviously communication with them matters uh, much as well. And, and I, I have no clue what Ramsey's actual dissertation might be. I don't know if he digs into the communication or emotional or human aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, he might be, it might be way more mechanical. He might be counting steps. He might be counting waking hours. He mm-hmm. might be counting travel time and that's probably what it tends to be. As you get more sciency, you try to go from that level and then break it down to a more human. Yeah, level. you still have that interface though with the athlete or the you know or somebody you're coaching about how you present the information to them. Nope, we're not going to do that today. We're going to do this and and or is it no? We're not going to do that today, and we're going to do this because yeah. And I think Ramsey, you and, know, from what I see from the outside, is amazing at that. It seems like the players are always tweeting them and joking around with them. It yeah. seems like uh, they really get along, and I think that's huge for. Any relationship. Uh, I was pretty lucky to be captain of my high school basketball team early and helped my str- I had a strength coach in eighth grade. And as soon as I became a sophomore in college, I was kind of the older guys in our strength and conditioning group. So mm. he kind of put me in a leadership role. So I kind of got some of these rules of being kind of a leader early mm-hmm. in life and, and had great mentors above me. My high school basketball coach and the captain of my basketball team was a senior when I was a freshman, were really good leaders. So I kind of got and my dad, uh, really good, really good taste of what it was to be a leader, uh, and how to communicate and how to connect with people. And that's obviously, uh, really important to the big picture of yeah. having success as a yeah. team, as a coach, as a trainer, as a, whatever your position might be is even a player. Um, but even more broken down uh, to Ramsey's situation, one-on-one communication with those people and having some kind of connection and trust built, uh, between athlete and, and coach powerlifting, basketball it doesn't really matter yeah kind of two things in my mind right now one of them being that um if you're an eyes on coach or if you're if you're doing video review with a with a client or or, or or whatever um like all i've ever done is really eyes on technique stuff and and then making a judgment about about calling weights that's that's pretty much all i've done but that's that's been a lot of years yeah and i and it just comes very naturally to you it doesn't necessarily mean you're right but you you can be very fucking sure yeah good guess you know you can make a good guess um, you see how if somebody is is failing on technique because they're tired, or they're failing on technique because they just are are mentally into it, or yeah. they're failing on technique because they have some kind of an injury someplace that's making them making some kind of adjustment. You can see those things out of the repetition of of um, of of just watching people. Yeah. You know, you just you get a sense of it after a while if you're sensitive to what's going on. And the other thing I w- had in mind is that like basketball players versus say baseball players baseball players they they can run these metrics on them they, they certainly look at pitchers and pitch counts and if you're a pitcher you can get um you, can, you know they'll, you hit your pitch count and they'll pull you out of the game regardless of the situation that you're you're in a lot of the time but there's a mental aspect to that too for sure because they don't want to they don't want to undermine your confidence right and say you uh, suck and that's why i'm pulling you or or bro, i'm throwing heat right now keep me out here yeah or if you've got an everyday position player who, um, you know, training staff might say, hey, that they look like they're a little tired or we're worried about this thing or whatever. And, you know, manager makes a lineup and the guy can go back to the manager and say, no, 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 I'm playing today. Yeah. And though he they can be overruled, they don't do it all the time. Right. Because it, then again, it, it turns into yeah. that situation with a mental aspect and, and personality clashes. and That's a big thing that... Uh, as a pet peeve of mine, like I, I've played sports my whole life, played at the college level, coached tons of college athletes, worked with pro athletes, worked with 
pro coaches. I've, I've worked with all this stuff, and and when I watch uh, even ESPN sometimes, but a lot of times, obviously the the, the what do they call it, the lazy boy quarterback or something, couch quarterback <laughs> yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Those guys just they look just pure on paper. Like so and so's better. Why isn't he playing yeah. like that? Like bro, it's so complicated. Like sports are human. Yeah. And humans are fucking complicated. And how things mesh together on a team, off a team, on the court, off the court uh, is so complicated. And then once you get at the pro level, uh, now you have start to have egos. You start to have business, yep. the salary involved. Yeah. Um, it's uh, so in- Incentives so based pieces. on games played or or, yeah. or quarters played or innings played or, or yeah. um, all those things are – I mean, they can – Guys can feel like they're getting undermined for sure toward those goals. Even by... at college, it happens all the time. Yeah. Man, I had a poor college experience because me and my coach weren't seeing eye to eye. He wasn't playing me what I thought I deserved from how I performed in practices and when I was on the court. He didn't let me allow me to play the position I want. There's so much politics and inner human stuff, and and junior colleges uh, even arguably more complicated than D1 because it's such a, a rattle case. Everyone's just trying to get a scholarship. Uh, yeah, there, there, I think there are more defined roles at D1. Yeah, D1, maybe. you know when you're getting, you know, either going to the school or getting signed a scholarship. Like, and yeah. the pro, a pro, a certain extent, is kind of like that too. Uh, some simplified, like, hey, we're going to pay you one mil a year and you're getting 10 minutes. That's what you expect. And yeah. you know when you get 10 minutes or the type of player you are, you're expected to take about five shots or whatever. It's almost simplified. We're in col- a junior college or maybe even D3. It's just like a fucking shit show. Every kid's there just trying to get looked at from a scout. Like, no one cares about winning. No one cares about anything but their own stats. Right. And the coach is just trying to win enough games or, or keep it non-messy so he keeps his job. And the uh, the um, uh, range of talent is broad. Yeah, it was bad. It was really in age. Uh, D1 basketball, I don't know if they have an age anymore, but D1 football and stuff has an age. You can't be older than 25. Yeah. Junior college, I was 18 years old uh, leaving this liberal arts school, and there's dudes that are 30 that just got out of prison <laughs> that just decided to go back to junior college. I'm like, oh, shit. Like, you know, like I was, it was weird, man. And oh, then, my yeah, God. Let alone the talent. But, yeah, age, it, it was a wild thing. And so um, I don't know where we went with that. But uh, it, it, it will be interesting to hear what Ramsey broke down because I, I did hear a lot of research. Um, and, and even the powerlifting world, it got really uh, – people wanted more scientific metrics, right? So with bar speed and monitoring yeah. um, what load you should handle that day, people started to use um, – uh, not Nintendo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tendo units. Uh, Tendo units. It, that's how I remind myself in my head. A Tendo yeah. unit, which which basically measures bar speed, and you know for yourself after using this thing, it's basically a wire that attaches to the barbell and sticks to the ground, and will measure how fast that wire moves, right. uh, meters per second or whatever. And you get a rating, and then over time, if you do this, you start to understand how fast you move a 500 pound deadlift, and whether it's a good day or bad day based on that, and how fast you maybe move around 90 percent or 100 percent. So you start to measure these things, and you can basically program based off of that. Another one is HRT. Uh, heart rate variability training so people would measure their heart rate or sometimes there's probably an iphone app by now you like put your thumb HRV, on it yeah, yeah HRV, um, sorry jill jameson has uh uh bunch Mor- of apps and things, uh, yeah. morpheus is what i think they currently have yeah and, and you shove your thumb in something or or they actually yeah, oh, you could you could probably actually measure your heart rate yeah there um morpheus there's a band and then there's yeah. a Kind of yeah, Fitbit type deal. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's actually kind of big, and you don't wear it the whole time. No, no, you measure it in the morning or yeah, before yeah. training or whatever. Different people have different protocol, but yeah, Joel yeah. Jameson was one of the first yeah. to start it, and they'll tell you what your heart rate is for that day. And the basics will give you like a red light, a yellow light, or a green light. Red light saying probably take it easier, don't train today. Yeah. Yellow light saying reduce the volume by a certain amount and sometimes you'll have a coach to help predict this for you or write it green light means you're recovered and ready to rock um, but i do think there's some uh That's, arguments against that so we can definitely ask ramsey what his thoughts are on that but yeah I think heart rate is just uh HRV is a good question. Yeah, that's yeah. another one. I heard about the Lakers uh, literally tracking everyone's steps on and off the court for like a season or something crazy like that. They start crazy. to really monitor um, stimulus from that, let alone on the court, um, and trying to adjust people's playing time, et cetera. Again, baseball, basketball, I think are really good um, and you know the other examples. Thing, another thing about that about the differences in sports, um, most sports are require or allow substitution. Baseball does not. True. And yeah, besides so, pitching. Yeah, when you – well, yeah, I mean, yeah, but no, no, you can substitute in any position. You just can't put them back in the game. Right. When they're out, they're out. Yeah, soccer's Whereas, like that a little bit. Oh, is it? I thought it was in and out. No, uh, not at the pro level. The okay. pro level, you only get two subs a game. Oh, okay. And, yeah, they can't come in and out. Basketball is like that. Yeah, it, it, baseball, basketball, really long seasons. Football, you could argue a little more stimulus, but you're playing less often. The frequency is way less. Baseball, baseball, arguably, depending on position, frequency is less. Yeah. Uh, basketball frequency is insanely fucking high. You can pull somebody out of a game, out of a 
out of a basketball game and yeah, have yeah. them be out for a while, right. throw them back in, you know. Yeah, and then and then and then it's up to you know that's why you know Ramsey respect to him for having all these meetings because he's got to go to the coach and give a, a you know maybe a maybe a little package on each player on how he mm -hmm. thinks they're performing or recovering or whatever because the coach not only has to win motherfucking games but he has to make sure these guys don't get injured and make sure that they can last eighty two uh eighty two games uh and so it's a, it's a, it's all a balancing act to keep these athletes not only happy performing well healthy. Um, and fresh, and that's, that takes a, a whole deal when there's millions and millions of dollars involved. Yep, absolutely. All right, I think that we um, got a button on this one. We'll just jump over to Ramsey now. They're, well, they're put together differently. I mean, if they were not put together differently, way they different. wouldn't be. Way different than me, man. Yeah, these dudes are like wouldn't be that impressive. Yeah. 6'10", 180, and you're like, I'm 5'9", 240. It's like the putty guy. People don't know sometimes though, like unless you play, like because you can play high school sports or whatever. But until yeah. you play against like literally NBA talent, you're like Fuck. the first kid I played against. I was a junior, I think. He was a freshman, full sign from eighth grade to UCLA, six eight. Yeah. Um, and he just comes at me, spin move, went to like, bang. Yeah, I'm like oh, oh yeah, bro, I I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm eighteen. You're fucking thirteen or something. For sure, uh, yeah. Every day in practice or a game, but definitely in practice because you just see like. Guys can get a little more flashy and just try things, obviously. Sure. So yeah. you'll watch stuff and you're like, yeah, that's a good reminder of why I'm on this side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be doing that. Yeah, there's no chance. Anytime soon. I actually watched, uh, there was, there's a, somebody that works for us and, uh, and he could play. Like, he could play. He's probably about my height, but he could go. Like, he could really play. Um, and he was, you know, talking a little trash to, uh, to Fox once he's like yeah I'll beat you and Fox like no you wouldn't even score <laughs> and so they like Fox finally was like alright man come on and not only was it 5-0 but the dude didn't even get a shot at the basket oh me, like, and, me and Ramsey talked about it too there's some local guys that I grew up with either coached against or played against that were good D uh, D1 talent uh, that are working in the office but there's a reason you're working in the office oh yeah. for sure like I'm talking about didn't even get a shot Like, <laughs> and Fox missed a couple and so the dude had the ball Yeah, but like Tried to pull up for a jumper, block. Well, there was one more. He drove pump fake Fox jumps. And because Fox is so springy, as he hits the ground, he, he just jumps again. And he's <laughs> second, like he blocks it. Yeah. It's like, you're done. Okay. That, that is a vet. I needed that. Yeah. Like, I needed that humbling. It would literally be like me and Ram playing like a sixth grader. Yeah. That's what it would be like. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Not surprising, but awesome. Yeah. Well, at, yeah. Athletes are athletes for reasons. They're, they're, Gifted in ways that the rest of us are not. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so our second question had to do with, uh, I think this was part of your dissertation, monitoring work. We're load. digging in. Let's do it. All right. So uh, we we talked about a lot of different aspects of this, like different ways that, that, that um, you might monitor somebody's workload, their recovery, mm -hmm. all that. Uh, heart rate variability or just taking just just tracking what they're doing on it mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis like he's i think mike talked about the lakers maybe counting every step yeah i heard a couple of years ago they started to count maybe they're one of the first in the league to try to count every single step taken on the court during the game and that may that might mm -hmm. even be normal now for every uh, uh team but what what are some factors you looked into um Obviously, a dissertation is probably a lot more in depth than what you may apply daily, mm -hmm. right? Because there's other factors going around, communication yep. and things that you can't really just write about, right? You can right. communicate with a guy like, "Yo, how you feeling today?" or whatever. Yep. Um, but what are some tools maybe you used, and, and what are some things you looked at? Um, you don't have to go in depth. Obviously, your dissertation probably took you years and a lot of brain power, so you could just scope <laughs> over that and then maybe talk about how you uh, apply it or what you do as a coach. Yeah, for sure. I, I can't share the specifics of it, um, but. I can kind of just go like an overview of yeah. kind of what's yeah. being done and stuff like that. And I mean, why. That's probably it. Uh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. I mean, the bi the biggest why, I think in, in general, when it comes to just monitoring workload and um, for the listeners, like all that really means is trying to objectively quantify what the demand on your body is, right, or the athlete's body. Mm -hmm. Um and so within there, you break it down usually into internal and external factors. Um, internal factors is, are, you can consider that how your body is actually responding. External factors is the demand that it's under. So if you look at something as simple as like volume load in a squat program or, mm. or, or a powerlifting program, uh, that's the external load. That's the demand on the body. Uh, and then the internal load is how they're responding. Now, you would measure that with either 
heart rate, heart rate variability, subjective wellness score, session RPE. Uh, so all those things come to mind. So powerlifting makes it uh, easy though. Really? Because now you got a lot of right, or, or even baseball, right? Like they've done this. Probably I don't. I'm not a baseball fan, but they've done this for a hundred years. Count how many throws a pitcher throws. Yeah, like yeah, that's sure. so easy. Yeah. Because yeah. that guy does one thing. Yep. A, a power lifter does three things. Yeah. But yep. now we got basketball guys. They're running. They're turning. They're jumping. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, there's so many, and then they're professionals, but they're young kids. They're going yeah. out at night. You know, they're having a good time. For sure. So we got other things to look at. Yeah. No, I, like Mike, you brought up. It. To me, like a point that's not made enough, which is none of this stuff is new. Like what you just talked about, right? Yeah. People have been pounding, counting pitch counts for years. Right. Like, this is right. not novel. Um, and now, sports science has made it really cool to talk about now because <laughs> mainly because the technology has advanced. Sure. Yeah. Um, so because we have technologies now that can just do crazy things, uh, it's taken off again. But it's definitely not new. Um, and the second point that I that I heard in there, which I think is super important, is. Um, the complications or limitations or complexity and actually quantifying the demand on the body because it's, it's relatively simple now in 2019 with the, with the technologies we have um, and the staffs that we have, like we now have, you know, there's certain people that have uh, or certain staffs that have people that just look at one part of this thing. Mm. Um, and so, <clears throat> but in, in 2019 with all that going on, what we still don't really understand is how, something like flight travel yeah. you want to stay up and play video games you want to go out and party um all of those things that you that are still stressors on the body that we just don't understand really how that might influence it and you can make wild guesses if you want but um how do you quantify that how do you quantify one beer from two beers yep. staying up uh or the time change that's the hardest with basketball yeah. is there's so many freaking games yeah. and you're going east coast to west coast east coast to west coast hotels sure. the airplanes. and you play every other day like on average yeah. You play 3.4 times a week. So you're playing every other day for six months straight on average in the NBA. And what's the average height of a, a team? Let's just randomly say 6'6", six, six, right? It's probably taller now, mm-hmm. but 6'6". Six, six. What kind of beds are you staying in that fit a 6'6 six, six guy? Yeah. What kind of cars are you in there? Like, yeah. There's so many well, like, I'll, shitty I'll, posture. I'll give the out on the bed part because mm-hmm. all the beds, most NBA teams now have contracts with hotels that the beds have to be big enough. So that is a thing. So they got a custom bed. It, well, they, they're just massive, yeah. God, like, um, no. But... That's like Shaq's cribs. Well, uh, side point. Uh, I heard, <laughs> I heard cribs. You probably grew up on cribs, right? Yep. I heard cribs was all fake and staged. They came out with the conspiracy that, or maybe even MTV might even said all those houses and cool shit was all rented. Oh, dude what a burst in my whole childhood wow because Shaq had a 30 foot that by was, 30 foot round bed that oh. was Instagram influence before Instagram influence yeah, that right was there. the best yeah light flex dude, all the that time was yeah. a light, that was a fake light flex yeah. all the time yeah <laughs> fucked up <laughs> fucked up MTV but like you gotta roll back to Wilt Chamberlain who had a room that was a bed like the whole room was yeah a I mean bed. when you're fucking that much yeah 20,000 yeah Chicks, I don't believe supposedly. it. Supposedly, I don't believe it. Do your dick would fall a, off? That was another flex. I'm yeah, sure. But. Yeah, that's all right. Back to custom beds, sleep, monitoring, lifting. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, where were we on that? I don't you're, know. You're you're, 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 you're you're scanning over the dissertation. What you were looking okay, at? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what I specifically looked at, um, well, not specifically, but at the top level, what I looked at is in in the NBA. There's a camera system that's running mm-hmm. uh, above the court in every NBA arena, and that tracks kind of what you were talking about with with steps. Um, mainly because it's video, it just gives you distance and time because mm-hmm. uh, you understand the dimor- dimensions of the court and you understand the time of the game. And with those, you can start to quantify speeds, accelerations, decelerations, distances. Um, we're supposed to get to a point, hopefully, in the next year or two or three where we're getting jump counts in games yeah so that's going to be uh, really cool that makes um, sense maybe just a horizontal camera i mean i'm no freaking scientist what the fuck do i know but it makes sense if you have one above and one to the side yep. yeah and you throw it into the a fancy program you can figure some between, shit out yeah, yeah. 3d uh, 4d I don't and there's know. already systems out there that track jump counts but you they just have to be on the body and in the nba you don't wear anything yeah because right. uh, crossfit just started that i think two years ago three years ago they, at the crossfit games uh they have everybody with like an anklet okay to do stuff like that cool which is interesting i like it i like it um so yeah then you take all of that information to, to try to grossly understand the demand or external load of the game um and in the nba because you play every other day that's the majority of your demand comes from games um especially if you're a high minute guy um, because on your off days it's either an off day it's a travel day or it's like a film day um so you're not going to necessarily go live all the time um you get some it, shots up, but that's what, yeah, because sixty percent you can't play a game every single day. Like every other day is already a lot, um, and then you take that and you start to try to understand why people perform the way they do, or 
perhaps more, I think, focused on nowadays, um, for better or worse, is why people get hurt the way they yeah. do or when they do or why they do. Um, and so that's kind of what we, we were looking at, and it's very common to look at that. You'll take, um, you know, somebody's external load, and then you'll try to understand, like, is this person at risk of injury? Uh, now, there's a million ways to try to go about understanding that, and there's limitations in every one of them. A very common one that has, I think, to, in my opinion, already peaked and on its way down because of how many limitations it has, but um, is something called the acute chronic workload ratio or training stress balance. And what the acute chronic workload ratio is at the very top level is just a measure of um, fatigue over fitness. And that's kind of the conceptual idea, mm-hmm. fatigue over fitness, and with a thought being that if you accumulate more fatigue than your fitness levels, then at some point you break down and you fail injured um the way you do it mathematically uh is you would just uh calculate a training load for a day and that could be something as simple as volume load um or distance in a game or number of accelerations there's a million ways you can do it but you would quantify the session load for the day and then what you would do is you would sum that up over your past week And then what you would do is do the same thing for the next month or the previous month. And then you average that out on a weekly basis. So you take your total load Mm -hmm. over the past month divided by four. That gives you an average. And then you take your previous week and then that gives you a ratio. What is your previous week divided by your average load over the past month? And now you get fatigue on one end, which is your previous week. So what's my total accumulated session loads over the past week divided by the average of the past month, which is your fitness or what have you prepared your body to do? So you ask the question of, is what I just did over the past seven days more or less or equal to what I've prepared my body to do over the past month? I've been getting 10 minutes a game for two months. Point guard goes out, Ram goes out. I'm in the starting lineup. All of a sudden, I'm getting 20. Boom. With those numbers, we yeah. boom. Yep. Uh, and so the easiest way to do it is if you ran um, 40 miles over the past month, mm. 40 divided by four is 10. Uh, if you ran 12 miles just in your past week, now you got 12. 12 divided by 10 is 1.2. Your acute chronic workload ratio is 1.2. And do you have a okay. number, or is there a given number that may be starting to get on that risk? Because that, that example right there, to me, seems like decent progressive overload, right? If I'm trying to run a marathon, I've never coached anyone to a marathon, but if you know some basic programming, I probably could, right? So mm-hmm. we run 10 miles for three weeks. And then we another three weeks, we're going to run 12 to 15 miles, right? Yep. And then we're going to run another 18. We're going to deload, and we're going to uh, try to... Boom, boom. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you go from 10 miles to 30 miles... Probably not good. Maybe not good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a little so bit of, too much of a jump there. Yeah. Too much of a jump. And so, um, yeah, so the sweet spot, quote unquote, that we begin to see in the literature that we thought we were seeing in the literature mm-hmm. um, is 0.8 to 1.3. So if I backtrack to that example of 10 miles on average the past month, 12 miles the past week, 12 divided by 10 is 1.2. Conceptually, all that means is exactly what you you kind of hinted at. You did 20% more last week than you're used to doing. So if we go back to 0.8 and 1.3, between 80% and 130% is kind of this sweet spot of load. Um, The front end is easy with the thought of if you do more than 30%, you're prepared for, or 130%, Mm -hmm. uh, then that's too big of a jump and fatigue might accumulate too fast and you may get injured. The back end on the 0.8 side is just the thought that if you underprepare, if you do nothing or you do too little, well, under preparation is not good either. You'll so lose fitness potentially. You'll lose fitness, yeah, right? Makes sense. Um, or potentially what simply is just going to occur the following week is uh, you took a little bit of week off, you lost a little fitness potentially, you, for whatever reason you're not ready, and now you're just setting yourself up for higher loads coming forward uh, or going forward. Um, so that's the thought, like right. point eight to 1.3, mm-hmm. don't under prepare, don't over train, have this little sweet spot, and it looks really good on paper. Uh, and then you c- color code it, call it red, yellow, and green, <laughs> and now you think you're doing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that sounds really good on paper. The yep. problem is in practice, and we know this just from coaching, right? If we want to talk about coaching, like you have some athletes that respond very well to bigger jumps, and mm-hmm. you have some athletes that get buried with little jumps. Yeah. And so as soon as you start to appreciate that, it's like, okay, that doesn't that doesn't match up. Like everybody is not the same, um, and because every that's the beauty of human biology, right? Like we're all not the same. Uh, so because of that, the 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 pretty little graph of pointing to one point three is probably not as compelling uh, as it once was, uh, and that's something that that's 
kind of pretty common to do is to kind of code these code people out mm-hmm. uh, into these like areas of red, yellow, and green. And, um, but I think as soon as you begin to appreciate the complexity of stuff, examples that come to mind are, um, so, you know, we have different training histories. Uh, if I was to take on, because of your background, and it, you, well, I don't know, you get, you've hit crazy numbers, right? Uh, no. Okay <laughs> numbers. So, you, well, your okay numbers put my bad numbers to shame, right? So if me and you were to go into a, just a, something as simple as squatting, and we've already talked about how basketball is so much more complex than that, but if you just take something as simple as like a squatting program, um, it's very likely that one of us can handle better jumps than someone else. Now, it might be because maybe I can because my absolute numbers are just lower, or maybe you can because you just have a training history that has some of these crazy loads in them. Uh, but there's certainly a difference there. Uh, and so within sport, what I begin to think about is like this idea of moderation. What moderates someone's ability to take on or tolerate loading spikes? So strength definitely comes to mind, like stronger athletes, weaker mm-hmm. athletes. Uh, now, I'm not confident enough to say that if you're stronger, then you can tolerate loads better because mm-hmm. that would be super biased because I'm a strength coach. Right. But but at some level, strength probably plays a role. And, and does that mean everyone needs to be able to hit a certain number two three times body weight squatter like probably not and maybe it's different like maybe maybe my sweet spot would mean i need to be able to hit two times body weight where you might be able to hit you might need 2.3 to be safe like we haven't ironed that stuff out at all and that's just one level because now you so now we're talking strength and conditioning right so now it's strength on one level mm-hmm. but what about conditioning right right what about repeat sprint ability what about speed what about all these things that come into play and now it's like oh now we're dealing with humans and we're trying to trying to predict or appreciate the complexity of injury within the complexity of biology right. like it's, it gets crazy and then you you throw in the last layer of which we talked about earlier lifestyle or or, yeah. or, or variables you can't count on because you sure. you know coaches and and they may give you a curfew in college or maybe even at the pro level but yep. are they doing it are they asleep yeah. you can't monitor every single thing they eat every position that they're in all day long because because mm-hmm. even little factors right you, you slump the whole plane ride from sacramento to new york and you're playing the knicks tomorrow like you're back's going to be jacked up and it's going to play a fatigue on your deadlift it's going to play f- some kind of fatigue on, on the court right, right. Uh, let alone obviously alcohol or sleep and, yeah. and, and things you just can't monitor the, all these numbers are great and we'll give you a ballpark like you kind of said it, it sounds great um, but the application of it is n- probably near impossible yeah no it's, it's tough I, I like to tell people like now be, just because something is very complicated and because we have a million limitations in it and because we can poke holes in it all day that's not necessarily to say that there's not value in it like mm-hmm. sure. what I what I like to tell people is probably consider looking at your weekly changes in loads um, just to understand what your jumps look like because that's probably needs to be appreciated. But then from there, also try to understand how you're handling it. So whether that's yourself taking a session RPE, um, whether using something as simple as like an RPE scale, right? Does the weight, the 225 that you deadlifted last week was an RPE of five, is, does it still feel like a five right? Yeah. or does it not? Right. What's your sleep looking like? There's very simple ways to do it. Um, so I think it just comes down. It, it really comes back to like this experimentation of understanding what my loading changes are looking like and how do I think I'm responding? Well, and that's why you're running the, 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 the program for the players and not an Excel sheet. Because right. all that data you just said, you could throw it in an Excel sheet mm-hmm. and Fox could show up, type his name in, and yeah. he could s- spit some shit out. Mm-hmm. But you can communicate with him. You could see how he's moving. You could see, you know how hard he played last night. Uh, compare, you know, computers can't tell how. He, he could yeah. take the same amount of steps in a, in a game, but play harder. You could just tell by watching or whatever. I mean, you're at every single game. So now you get to make a judgment call because you're, you're the coach. Right. And that, that's For why sure. a robot's not doing those things. For sure. And that's why, f- I mean, that just at the top level strength and conditioning. That's why flexible programming to me is so important. Um, because if guy, as guys walk in, if you had a plan A written on the board, like are you going to stick with that? Or are you going to change? There's certain times where you might want to stick with it if you're looking to overtrain them a little bit for whatever reason. Um, but I think all that just has to be understood and appreciated. Like, what's the context of the situation? So, are you able to to quantify this the subjective part of it? The you know your own reaction to what you see in in their performance is there is there a way to track that do you feel that i mean obviously internally we can do rpe or whatever but um in personal experience if somebody says that you know they just squatted and they said yeah that felt like a, a seven and you're like to me that looked like a nine yep. i'm sorry yep. you know and so yeah, egos might play yeah right. and right. they're not lifters yep like right. they're not lifters for sure they play for basketball sure. yeah, yeah no for sure um 
Yeah, I mean, stuff like that's pretty easy. Just throw a Tendo on it, right, and track the speed. Mm -hmm. So now it's oh, pretty yeah. objective. Like, we don't even ask you how it felt. Like, I, you, because because there's also times where you might feel really good, but if your performance is bad, like, there might be something in there too. Yeah. Right? Because uh, you can feel good for all the things that we can't quantify that can break a body down, like sleep, et cetera, et cetera, relationship problems. The back end could be it too. You You can be beat down, but I mean, I just think of like something as simple as like, uh, if you're if you're in an overtraining cycle and you're getting you know you're trying to bury yourself a little bit with some with you know whether it's a squat program or uh, a deadlift pro like whatever that side of the equation is, well if you go home and I don't know you've been chasing a girl around for a month and she finally wants to go on a date with you like well you're probably gonna feel good the next yeah, day PR's yeah. coming so yeah. like <laughs> so like how do you, like all of that this one's for you Stephanie <laughs> yeah uh, and so those things influence for sure and and. Um, so like we, we want to appreciate that, which, which to me is like the back end of like, if you're plan a, a player walks in and he feels like, you know, it doesn't feel great. And you can, you can quantify that just by using wellness uh, surveys, mm -hmm. right? Top of like three, five questions, however, you know, what's your mood like, what's your sleep like? You can ask him how much did you sleep? Um, or like how fatigued do you feel? Something as simple as that might be pretty valuable. Um, mm. uh, now if you had a plan a and they say they're feeling great, we'll make, now you can push it a little bit if you want to, like, or they're feeling bad. Maybe you need to pull back. Um, so yeah, I mean, on top of wellness surveys though, you can use tendos. Use you can use a standardized load mm -hmm. and just what does that move like today? Um, if you're gonna do that, you probably want to wait till after warm up sets occur because um, we know that that stuff influences some of yeah. those outputs. Yeah, sure. um, you can use jumping um, even if you're just at home and you have like. Even if you just have a vertex um, or some way to measure your jump height, whether it's a piece of tape on the wall or something like how high can I jump today versus yesterday versus two days ago, um, you can track those outputs. Um, I mean, there's a million things you can do, uh, but ultimately it's just trying to figure out how your body feels really, right? And so for us, um, you know, we, we want to appreciate all of those things. Um, and we've I've played around with surveys in the past, Um and I've I've even done things to start looking at like how survey scores, like a player wellness score, mm. is changed by the changes in loads in a game, right? Do the loads in a game actually influence what they're giving us perceptionally, right? Okay. Do they perceive, yeah. are are they feeling better or worse based on the loads in the game, or are they not? Right. Um, or wins and losses, yeah. like you yeah. said with the girlfriend thing, like bro, you just, oh, you sure. just hit a buzzer beater last night, like yeah, I'm gonna deadlift today, coach. Sure. I'm fucking yeah. feeling sick, yeah. And and, and you you see some of that stuff, right? Like when we come off a big win. The energy in the room is usually high the next day, like, mm -hmm. and we could have had a, a everyone could be a, have a high acute chronic workload ratio, yeah. but like it because all these other things play a role. Um, how good the hype video is that night? Oh, for sure, <laughs> yeah. oh, for sure. Or how good the hype coach is, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. what's my energy like? What what yeah. energy am I bringing them when they come yeah. down the stairs? Am I giving them energy or am I taking energy from them? Right, and that's like yeah. those are things I try to think about, like what. Am, what is my energy doing for them? And if it's not bringing them up, then maybe I just don't need to say nothing right now. Like, um, and not usually I'm talking some Matt, you know. Yeah. But it's hard too because you're on the grind too. You're on the freaking road. Like your your emotions are going up with the team. You're you're tired too. Like it's not like you're sure. it's not like you're just sitting at home texting them something. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. There's I mean there's times when you're on the road, even just as a staff member, support staff member, and you know we get back to back on the road, and uh, we're about to enter an East Coast road trip coming up. Um, and you get to tip off at like 7 p.m. and and it's cold outside. It's snowy. Like it doesn't snow in Sacramento. Like it's yeah. snowing, and you're like, man, I'm exhausted. How are they about to do this? But the ball goes up and they got to go. Yeah, uh, which it, is why they're incredible athletes. Yeah, why they get paid the big bucks. True. We got anything else on this that uh, is a good takeaway, or do you think we got um, count? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest part is just just do stuff. Like if you're just just do something like try it out for a little bit and just mm -hmm. see if it gives you valuable because with all the technology that's out there with all the research that's out there with all the excel spreadsheet stuff that can, like this stuff can get really complicated but it could be as simple as downloading some type of survey on your phone or mm -hmm. making your own and putting it by your the side of your bed and every day when you wake up after your shower and like not immediately because we all feel a little sore when we're in the bed but like mm -hmm. once you get up and you're ready for put it by your coffee maker and just write a little score down and every day just track that thing and just see like okay, what do my numbers in training look like versus how I'm feeling here? Uh, match that up probably with a body weight because some mm -hmm. of that stuff. And, like, there you go. Now you're Sleep. a sports scientist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, just try to track some things because no matter how complicated you make it, it's not necessarily going to be more right. So keep it simple. Uh, kiss, right? Keep it simple, stupid. That's it. All right. Where can people find you? 
uh, Instagram is Dr. Dot Ramsey Dot Nijem N I J E M is the last name, and then uh, Twitter Dr. Ramsey Nijem. Awesome! Thanks for being with us. <laughs>